adversaries of God's people. This is where we got to the point that Ezra, and in Ezra writing it, remember it's not exactly Ezra yet. Ezra won't go back until the second half of the book. So we're looking at more along the lines of what's taking place with, with Zerubbabel and with Josedek as they go back. Remember our timeline, We've got an, we had an extensive timeline, I think everyone had gotten a chance to take a look at it, but we have them going back, and when they went back, that marked the end of the 70 years that Jeremiah had prophesied they'd be in captivity. They go back, they start on the, they, they start on the temple, and at, at the very beginning, how did they feel about the temple? They were really, really happy about it. And some of the ones who were older, very sad about it. Why were they sad about it? Because they knew it wasn't going to match the glory of, of Solomon's temple. I, there's no telling how to know the proportion of people who were sad versus happy about it. Just no telling. But when the opposition came, then it just wasn't enough for them to overcome. You know, when, when, it, when it comes to opposition, it, it all comes down to what you value. So if you value something enough, you're going to keep going no matter what anyone says to you about it. If, if you see the value in it, you're going to keep on going with it. And of course, hopefully you, you, know, you make the right decision on value and, and picking something that has great value to make a sacrifice. Sometimes we pick things that aren't very valuable to make sacrifices for, and that's our mistake. But being someone who's godly will take a lot of sacrifice, but there's a lot of what in it? There's a lot of value in it. And for whatever reason, they just didn't seem to get the, the value to actually continue on in opposition. Because in Ezra chapter 4, that kind of outlines the opposition. And the opposition came at various times, because as you'll see in verses 1 through 5, it just opens up and tells you about it. But then when you get into 6 through 23, that gives you the evidence of it. And the evidence of it at that point in time is recorded by the official letters that's written to the people who are over the Jews at that time. And it's not just one letter at one period of time. I think I mentioned last time that it jumps around and it's in different time periods that the opposition was, was constantly there. Well, the end result in verse 24 was what? They stopped building. Yes, they stopped building. So, as I go backwards here, how long did they stop building for? About 15 years. And then who comes along? In Ezra chapter 5, who comes along? Haggai and Zechariah. So, temple work, if has, in Ezra chapter 1, in Ezra chapter 5, 1 and 2, then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, rose up and began to build the house of God which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. This gives you just a little bit of insight into prophecy, so I might as well mention it very quickly. What is the nature of prophecy? But before you answer that, let me ask it differently. What do you think most people's understanding of the nature of prophecy entails? A prophet's doing what? Is telling the future. These prophets were more along the lines of what prophecy was in the Old Testament. Meaning that prophecy was what? How would you define it? It's messages from God. Now, did it relate to the future? A, a lot of it did. There's no question that a lot of it related to the future. The important part was not all of it related to the future. If you boiled it down, I would say that less than half of it related to the future. And a slightly larger majority of it 
dealt with the present. What the people were doing right now. And you need to change what you're doing right now. This is a great example of it. Haggai and Zechariah come to them and, and what do they do? They tell them what? You need to get busy. And again, the, the text of Haggai and Zechariah do it in two completely different ways. Haggai has more of a, uh, has more, we would, we would call it a homiletic style, meaning that Haggai comes and basically preaches sermons to the people. He basically comes and preaches sermons to the people. I don't know if you've ever heard it that way, but that's essentially what he does. Zechariah, on the other hand, does what? And it's hard to miss what Zechariah does. Zechariah gives visions. Visions. He tells them about all of these visions that he's had from the Lord, and all of them, all of the visions have essentially one major point. And that point is God wanted them to build and to finish the temple. So when you look in Ezra chapter 5, Ezra doesn't detail about how the prophets did it. It's just the fact that they came and did it. So in Ezra chapter 5, you've got starting in verse 3. At the same time, Tatnai, the governor of the region beyond the river, and Shethar Bosnai and their companions came to them and spoke thus to them. Who's commanded you to build this temple and finish this wall? Then accordingly we told them the names of the men who were constructing this building, but the eye of their uh, but the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, so that they could not make them cease till a report could go to Darius. Then a written answer was returned concerning the matter. So the, the temple is resumed, or the work is resumed. And then as it's resumed, here we have the kind of the officials, the higher level people getting involved. Then we start in verse 6, and then the rest of the people get involved in building this temple. And that goes on from verse 6 all the way to the end of the chapter itself. The work resumes. Once it resumes, again, thinking back to the chronology, or if you have the chronology in front of you, once it resumes, how long does it take them to finish it? So it had sat idle for about 15 years. Once they start it again, it takes them about how many years to finish it? Not too many. About five years to finish it. So from kind of beginning to end, you've got a process of around 20 years. And chapter 6 relates then how that's going to be finished. Ezra chapter 6, starting in verse 1, Then King Darius issued a decree, and a search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon. And at Akmetha, uh, in the palace that is in the province of Media, a scroll was found. And it, a record was written thus, In the first year of King Cyrus, King Cyrus issued a decree concerning the house of God. At Jerusalem, let the house be rebuilt, the place where they offered sacrifices. Let the foundations of it be firmly laid, its height 60 cubits, its width 60 cubits, with three rows of heavy stones and one row of new timber. Let the expenses be paid from the king's treasury. Let the gold and the silver articles of the house, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple, which is in Jerusalem, and brought to Babylon, be restored and taken back to the temple, which is in Jerusalem, each to its place." And deposit them in the house of God. So the official letter says what? They were able to, to do it. And they were able to do it for what reason? It's down to official, yeah, official record, official decree. These people would go and do exactly what they wanted. So the opposition that was in chapter 4. The opposition that's spoken of in chapter 5 was, in a sense, illegal because you kind of had the Supreme Court way on the matter. And what did the Supreme Court say? They've got authority. Not only did they have authority to do it, but we have to what? We have to pay for it because that's what the decree says. So let's look down in verse 13. Looking down in verse 13. In verse 13, then Tatnai, the governor of the region beyond the river, Shethar Bosnai and their companions diligently did according to what King Darius had said. So the elders of the Jews built and they prospered 
There is a prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Idu. They built it and they finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes the king of Persia. Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which is in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. So it's, it's completed and then we get into verse 16, which gives us just a few more details that we'll notice. The children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the rest of the descendants of the captivity celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. They offered sacrifices at the dedication of the house of God, 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs. And as a sin offering for all of Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, they assigned the priests to their divisions and the Levites to their divisions over the service of God in Jerusalem as it's written in the book of Moses. So what did they do? They get it finished, and then what? They kind of go back and and dedicate now this this new structure. I I don't want to say rededicate it. They actually dedicate this new structure. And as as best as I could find it, this was something that I think reasonably approximates it. There were, when you go to look for pictures online of the temple, they are notoriously hard to discern which ones could have been period appropriate. And I debated between bringing this one and another one, so I'll just tell you what the other one looked like. This one you can see in the, in the front, it's got the nice looking capitals. It's, it's, it's a building that was, that was built with, with some decoration to it. Uh, they're doing it as a as a way of of course to show their reverence to God to to show the the exalting of God the the value of God but again when they came back from captivity they didn't have what they didn't have much money they didn't have the resources so an, another picture that I saw that depicted it may very well have been more accurate and when I say it was essentially a cinder block facility, it was a cinder block facility. And this picture had no, no decorative points on the outside. It, it wasn't appointed in any way in a, in a decorative fashion like this one. Which one is the truth? There's, there's no way to know. I would tend to think that the people at least built it in a very Spartan fashion, and then maybe over time made it a, a little bit better. Because how long did they have this temple? How long did they have this temple? It's, it's amazing. You know, how, when we build a house, how, how old is an old house? A hundred years. And boy, once a house gets hundred years, it's, it's what? It's, uh, you know, we, we do have some historical homes that are, of course, older than that, but it takes a lot of intentional, purposed work and a lot of budget to keep them that way. So there's not many of them. They came back and built this temple when was, so it took about 20 years. So when was the year, essentially, when it was dedicated, done and dedicated? The year five. 15 B.C. Herod's temple took how long? Do you remember in John chapter 2, Jesus comes and He prophesies. And and what does He say? Destroy this temple and I'll build it again in three days. And the Jews said, that's ridiculous. Why? We've been working on this for 40 years. Six years, if, if I can remember the number correctly. So Herod's temple goes apparently until, or, or this temple here goes until not that long before the time of Jesus. So that means it's going to be in use around 450 years. Around 450 years. And it's, gotten, it's going to go through a lot in 450 years. The, the main thing that it's going to go through in the intertestamental times is that someone named Antiochus Epiphanes comes in and does what to it? He doesn't destroy it, but he does 
desecrate it. He desecrates it. And after he desecrated it, you had the Maccabean Revolt. The Maccabean Revolt comes along and it, it restores that temple because they had victory over the, the Syrian conquerors who were trying to Hellenize the Jews. What, what's the celebration of that victory called today? This is really neat if you've never known this. What's the celebration of that victory of the Jews in the intertestamental period when they, they kicked the Greek influences out and restored their temple? Hanukkah. It's Hanukkah. So, you know, again, that, that is with us obviously until this day. It was an incredible, significant event. Not only in the, in the Jews, but has become, you know, a significant event the world over now. And it was because they had come in and desecrated this temple that they had rebuilt. So this was a big, big deal for the Jews to accomplish this. And it, and it wasn't as nice. It, it wasn't as glorified as Solomon's temple. But it was God's house. And they treated it accordingly. They offered sacrifices. And what else did they do in the chapter that we read? They restored the worship of the priest. And this harkens back again to, a, to an Old Testament time. You had the Levites. And when you talk about all of the Levites, at the largest part, you know, it was... When we know the rough estimate of the children of Israel is when they came out of captivity. And, and what was that rough estimate? There were how many? People, children of Israel, all together. There were, again, all we can do is guess, two to three million. Because at the beginning of the wilderness wandering and at the end of the wilderness wandering, they were numbered. Those two numbers were not significantly different from one another. The number of, of fighting men who were numbered were how many? 600,000, okay? So... From the time of the captivity until the time of David and Solomon are about 500 years, of which you could reasonably assume that the number of Levites over 500 years is only going to what? Is going to only go up. So they, they had the situation where you've got a lot of Levites and maybe kind of a little bit of chaos trying to figure out how do we do what we do so David broke them down into courses, into 24 different courses. So he divided them so every one of them would serve for a week and then they would go through this rotation. And a lot of scholars believe that, that the rotations would come along about every couple of years. 24 rotations, 52 weeks out of the year. So everyone would do a couple of weeks per year. This is where we find Zacharias in Luke chapter 1, by the way. In, in Luke chapter 1, where is Zacharias? He's in, the, he's in the temple. And this is one of the rare occasions where he's getting in his lifetime to actually be there serving God. So in order to get everyone the opportunity to serve God, they broke them into courses in David's time. And here they're kind of reappropriating that apparently that similar setup that they'll use going forward. So everything to them is looking good, getting back to what they should have been. And then the end of chapter 6, just real, quick, real quickly, in the end of chapter 6, starting in verse 19, now what are they doing? What are they celebrating? The Passover. Putting everything, you know, or trying to put everything back together as to what God wanted them to do and wanted to be. And this is, for the Jews, a... I mean, a, a really remarkable period in their history. We kind of want to look at it in, an, in a negative way in that they got discouraged because they knew it wasn't going to be as glorious of a building. It probably wasn't. But at the... You know, definitely when you're looking in Ezra 5 and 6, what really turned them around was the work of who? Who? And uh, who turned them around? The work of who? We just we've just read it. 
It was the work of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, which actually is in a way, in, its, in and of itself, a nice message because when people kind of get discouraged and maybe they kind of get a little bit into a, into a realm where they shouldn't be because of discouragement or some other reason, what can bring people around? The Word of God. The, the Word of the Lord. And, and someone there who's, who's willing to proclaim it. Again, you get to see the nice power of the Lord. But we want to concentrate on adversaries in the last part of this lesson, which we'll talk about now and we'll finish up next time. Adversaries and thinking about adversaries. So the adversaries of the Jews, we had them in Zerubbabel's day. They existed in Esther's day. Because remember, Esther in time is just about to come up after we get out of Ezra 4, 5, and 6, then, again, trying to conceive it all at the right time, then is where Esther fits in. And in Esther chapter 7, which really it was all the way through the book of Esther, but in Esther chapter 7, what did they want to do to the Jews? They wanted to destroy them. Yes, they wanted to destroy them. And then in Nehemiah's day, in Nehemiah chapter 4, which we'll eventually get to, what did they want to do in Nehemiah's day? It wasn't as, dr it wasn't as drastic what they want to do. They wanted to stop the work, the, the building of the wall. So again, the, the point is, we're always going to have what? We're always going to have adversaries. And I think something that's remarkable to this is that it speaks to the element of adversaries. The Bible speaks to the element of adversaries. Because in multiple places, and I've got here in front of you, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 25, Luke chapter 12, verse 58, Luke chapter 13, verse 17, Luke 8, Luke 21, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, and then in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 27, we've all got what? We've all got adversaries. And these adversaries, as you look through all of these different passages, the, these adversaries are who? Well, it's in, in front of you here. It's specifically in each one of these cases, the adversaries are unbelievers. Unbelievers. Look up here. They're, they're unbelievers. Now, obviously, that brings a larger question into play. Because, as you guys have said, the main adversary that we have to face is the devil. Why is it so ironic to speak of the devil as the adversary? Okay, so some people don't even believe he exists. But why is it ironic to speak of the devil as adversary? It's because the word Satan means adversary. The word Satan means adversary. So a lot of people believe that he doesn't exist. So what can that mean? Because there's kind of different shades of the fact that Satan doesn't exist in some people's mind. What can that mean? They certainly can disbelieve in Satan because they would believe that a good God wouldn't allow Satan to exist. I, abs, absolutely. What else? What else? Right, so, you know, again, if you believe that Satan doesn't exist, then you kind of throw out the idea that there could be absolute moral right and moral wrong. Some believe that Satan exists, but they're fairly convinced he's just what? He's very benign. In fact, he's not only just kind of very benign, he's just really kind of what? Imaginary or, or funny, cartoonish, because really, how do we first, in, in what kind of way do we get exposed to Satan, you know, in our society? How do we first get exposed to Satan? Through very cartoonish ways, you know, admittedly, whether you see it, whether you see it 
on television shows, whether the kids see it on cartoons, whether you see it, uh, Janelle had mentioned Halloween, we see it in very cartoonish ways. What does that do with someone's belief in Satan? Yeah, I would say that it most definitely tempers it. So it's like they don't completely reject that Satan exists, they just reject what? That I should really take him seriously. And that is a mistake. Because classically, as 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 says, what does Satan do? Satan, who is our adversary, which by the way, both of these passages speak of specifically Satan being an adversary. So what does he do? He's like a roaring lion seeking those whom he might devour. How does Satan devour us? He tempts us, which we'll talk about tonight in trying to take care of those temptations. He, he tempts us. And when, you know, when, when, when He tempts us and we give in to it, it's not like we're immediately gone forever. But it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. In fact, I think that's, in fact, that's how I'm going to actually begin the lesson tonight. It doesn't take much. I can be tempted, and I can give in to that temptation, but I can't give in what? I can't keep giving in very long before what happens. Yeah, I, I've essentially let my conscience be seared. There's, there's three terms in the New Testament that we'll look at tonight. The first one is just simply that it, it sears the conscience, it destroys the conscience. And no more do I, do I care. And in that way, Satan has devoured you. You know, we can overcome it, but we have to understand we have adversaries today. And these two classes are, I mean, simple to understand. First of all, the class of every unbeliever forms an adversary against us. And again, all of these passages speak to this. But it's the, the larger foe is the adversary of Satan, who's always working trying to tempt people, bring them down to destroy them spiritually, and pull them away from God permanently. And, and that's those adversaries. So we keep looking at next time all of these adversaries, and then if we have time next time, we'll move into Ezra chapter 7. We'll move into the second half of the book.